My topic, I have a half hour to talk about uh, so basically my, some of my observations of how Austrian economics has affected academia. Uh, since I was an economics professor for 41 years and I uh, recently retired from Loyola University in Maryland and had a lot of experience with it. And my, my first semester in uh, graduate school in uh, the fall of 1976, I walked into the uh, PhD level uh, microeconomics class taught by Richard Wagner, and there were two textbooks and, and, and dozens of journal articles on the syllabus. And one textbook was Milton Friedman's uh, price theory book, and the other one was this one, Human Action by Ludwig von Mises. And that's really what got me hooked on Austrian economics. And I thought, you know, and Professor Wagner was a, a great professor. He was not the best orator. You had to listen very, very carefully. But the substance of what he was saying was, uh, was far superior, I thought, to what all the other professors were saying about anything because he was talking about Austrian economics. And it created quite a, uh, a bit of a controversy. This was at... Uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University before it became Virginia Tech. They changed the name. And the controversy was the mainstream mathematical economists and the game theorists in the department hated the fact that uh, Professor Wagner was using human action and teaching real economics uh, rather than sort of half-baked mathematics. And what they did was at the end of every, uh, you know, when you, the program was set up so that when you finished all your coursework, you had to take comprehensive exams in everything, micro, macro, econometrics, two fields of specialization. And so uh, in the class on that year, not my class, but the, the class that was taking the comprehensive exams that year, they held them hostage. They held the exams. This was before the internet. They had the paper exams and they held them hostage as negotiating tools to negotiate to get Wagner out of that class, among other things, and to get and to teach more mainstream sort of mathematics as microeconomics rather than rather than that. And that was sort of the that, those are the bad old days. This was 1976, and, uh, and uh, Tom and others talked about the. Uh, the conference in New Hampshire in 1974 that sort of tried to revive that. And so that, that was my introduction to uh, <clears throat> where Austrian economics stood at the time. And around the same time, uh, shortly before that, in the New York Times on January 1st, 1974, Paul Samuelson was interviewed. And Samuelson wrote uh, the, the, the famous textbook, Principles of Economics, <clears throat> that totally dominated the economics textbook world from 1948 well into the 1980s. He sold over 4 million copies of that book, and almost all the other textbooks were clones of Paul Samuelson's book. So his influence was, uh, was gigantic, was humongous. And here's what Samuelson said, well, what motivated economists like himself in the New York Times, January 1st, 1974, he said, quote, economists work for the only coin worth having, the applause of their peers. What a jerk. I read that, what is it, the applause of our peers. I'm sure he didn't mind making the profits on four million book sales either. I'm sure that motivated him uh, to, uh, to some degree. So he, Samuelson and, and his, his ilk dominated education, academic education and economics all that time. One of the things uh, in his book uh, where he, he portrayed the so-called perfect competition model, which is not the model of competition that the Austrians believe in. The Austrians believe competition is a dynamic process of rivalrous, uh, dynamic comp uh, entrepreneurship. But the, the uh, so-called perfect competition model that was invented uh, really in, the, in the, around the 1930s had this bizarre set of assumptions of uh, homogeneous products, everybody produces the same thing, everybody charges the same price, uh, there's no advertising because everybody knows everything, perfect knowledge, and so forth, uh, nirvana, a yeah, perfect world. And in his textbook, Samuelson said, he taught generations of students, well, when you think about it, the only products that fit into this definition of pure competition 
are things like cotton and natural gas, because they're homogeneous, cotton is cotton, now, although that's not even true, but that's what he said, and natural gas is natural gas. Although at the time, cotton in America, there were, there were price floors on cotton. So cotton was sold at monopolistic prices because of regulation. And natural gas, of course, was sold by government-run monopolies and the, the so-called natural monopolies that were regula either, either government-owned or government-regulated monopolies in, in the public utilities industries. So he gave us his examples of pure competition to monopolistic industries. And everything else, he said, was even worse, even more monopolistic or had some other problem and in need of regulation. And of course, this is one area where the, the Austrians uh, really have made tremendous progress in explaining uh, the, the, the fallacies of the perfect competition model over the years. But that's where it stood in the uh, beginning of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Samuelson was also famous for his uh, 1988 edition of his textbook where he said that, uh, a, quote, a socialist economy can thrive. And he predicted that by the year 2000, Soviet GDP would exceed the U.S. GDP. And, uh, and of course, uh, two years later, the Soviet Union didn't even exist, as far as that's concerned. So that's what he taught generations of students. And he accepted, he, he said this because he accepted as truth statistics put out by the Soviet Union and the CIA on, 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 <laughs> to, to make this projection. And he made this sort of ignorant projection with two lines, you know, here's the one line like this, and the other line like that, and the, the Soviet line was gonna exceed the American trend line of uh, GDP growth over time, so he thought. And of course, uh, that, that was all uh, uh, debunked very, very quickly. And, and, and of course, no one explained this, why this, this was a big hoax. Samuelson, Samuelson's uh, uh, projection was a big hoax more than the Austrians. And, and, and so of course, once uh, social, socialism around the world collapsed in the late 80s, early 90s, even socialist economists like Robert Heilbrunner, who had spent decades promoting socialism, basically, wrote a big mea culpa article in the Atlantic Magazine, the New Yorker rather, New Yorker Magazine in, uh, I believe it was October 1990, where he said Mises was right. Mises, Mises was right all along. Uh, capitalism has defeated socialism. Uh, although in the same article he says, but fellow socialists, those are not his words, those are my words, but he's saying, but fellow socialists, there is still hope. We can still reinvent socialism by regulating uh, capitalism in the name of saving the planet. And, and hence the watermelons were born. Green on the outside, red on the inside. And that, so that, that was, that, that's been the game plan ever since Robert Halbrunner announced it in 1990 for the, for the socialist world. Around the same time, around 1989, I was invited by Jerry Gunderson to give a talk to the economics faculty at Trinity College and he asked me to talk about socialism, the, 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 uh, the calculation of Ada Mises, Hayek, ideas on socialism, which I did. And this was 1989, and, this, and Trinity is a well-regarded school, was then, still is now. And uh, uh, the looks on the faces of the faculty were like they had all been sucking on lemons when I said that. And they, they really kind of, kind of insultingly lectured me by saying, this, this debate was over a long time ago. Abba Lerner and Oscar Longe won that debate. You know, don't, don't you know? And they, they told me, all you have to do is calculate the equilibrium conditions, the general equilibrium conditions. That's all you need to do to prove that socialism can work. And this is 1989. It's right in the middle of the collapse of socialism as, as far as uh, this is concerned. And so, and so that's, but like I said, this is what a lot of the mainstream thinking was. It was so wedded to these ideas, but nobody, no, nobody more than the Austrians, and especially through the Mises Institute's efforts, has smashed this idea to smithereens in terms of the economics of socialism. And so, we, so there you can still, you can already see the progress being made. Uh, continuing to beat up on Samuelson, he said this about the Fed, 
I call this the Immaculate Conception Theory of the Fed. And this, was, this is what was taught to generations of college students. Here's Samuelson, he says, quote, the Federal Reserve's goals are steady growth in national output and low unemployment. Its sworn enemy is inflation. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. Go ahead and laugh. If aggregate demand is excessive so that prices are being bid up, the Federal Reserve Board may want to slow down the money supply. Yeah. But then again, it may not. That's, those are my words. Uh, uh, thereby slowing aggregate demand and output growth. If unemployment is high and business languishing, the Fed may consider increasing the money supply, thereby raising aggregate demand and augmenting output growth. In a nutshell, this is the function of central banking, which is an essential part of macroeconomic management. And so it's all, you know, it's all very lovingly described, you know, the features. Of my, my old professor, James Buchanan, called this the benevolent despot theory of economics, assuming the, the people who run the Fed or any other government agency are benevolent despots. Now, compare this to what Murray Rothbard once said about the Fed, and this is classic Murray Rothbard, tongue-in-cheek, sarcastic as hell. He said, the Federal Reserve, and he's talking about how the Federal Reserve looks at itself. He says, the Federal Reserve, guided by monetary experts, independent of the public's lust for inflation. How many of you have a lust for inflation? Do you, you, you want to pay higher grocery prices, more for gasoline? You want to pay double for the next new car? You have a lust for inflation? Well, that's what the Fed thinks. You have a lust for inflation. It stands, the Fed stands ready at all times to promote the long-term public interest by manning the battlements in an eternal fight against inflation. The public, in short, is in desperate need of absolute control of money by the Federal Reserve to save it from itself and its short-term lusts and temptations. So, you know, thank God for the Fed. That, that, that's Murray's sort of sarcastic uh, 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 statement about that. And of course, as Patrick uh, 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 told us this morning, and as all you, you know, maybe everybody here knows, who has done more to discredit the Fed than the Austrian school, and particularly the Mises Institute, as, as far as that's concerned, there never would have been a Ron Paul revolution had Ron not been a, able to read the Austrian critiques and educate himself about the Fed and, and do just the, the best job in the world of articulating these ideas to the general public and causing thousands thousands of college students at, what was it, the University of Michigan, who began spontaneously chanting, end the Fed, end the Fed. That would have never happened had it not been for Austrian scholarship. I had, a, I had a very good student several years ago who was an economics major, and he took my American economic history class, and uh, he told me he, uh, he had taken all the classes on money. He had taken all the macro classes, three of them, uh, money and banking, uh, mathematical monetary theory class, and he came to my class, and about two-thirds through, he said, you know, I, ha I, took an all, I took all these courses, and I had no idea that there were actually criticisms of the Fed. Who would ever have thought? He didn't know that. And I, I sent him to Mises University, and he, he came twice to Mises University. And so he, he, he was straightened out over that. Now, another, another Austrian economist, Larry White, he, uh, he, he published a, an article in one of the monetary journals several years ago where he found that 75 to 80 percent of all journal articles on monetary economics had an author with a, quote, Fed affiliation. In other words, paid in some way by the Fed, okay, according to Larry White. And he quotes Milton Friedman as saying this. He says, Friedman said, quote, if you want to advance in the field of monetary research, you would be disinclined to criticize the major employer in the field, end quote. So in other words, the Fed pays 75 to 80% of everybody who writes in the, in the academic journals on monetary theory. And so of course, you would expect students like my former student to be totally in the clouds and be unaware that there are criticisms of the Fed, even after he was taught by three or four PhD professors uh, different aspects of monetary theory in these, uh, in these classes. And so that, that is certainly one area where we've made uh, a big impact in the whole world now, uh, people all over the world now uh, read the Austrian literature and Mises.org and understand this.
Another thing I would mention about uh, a, a piece of uh, uh, good news and where we've had an effect is there's this book by our friends Richard Vetter and Lowell Galloway called Out of Work. It's a history of unemployment in America. And one of the things they concluded in this book, and Murray Rothbard really liked this book, he, he, because they, in, in the first chapter of it, they explain how it's, it's very sort of Austrian in orientation, although it's sort of a hybrid. They use a lot of econometrics and a lot of sort of mainstream neoclassical theorizing, but, but it's still very solid. But Murray loved this book. And their, one of the conclusions was the Great Depression, may, uh, or the New Deal rather, made the Great Depression worse, deeper, and longer lasting. Now, just a, about seven or eight years ago, uh, a, a real big shot, a real mainstream big shot, the editor of the American Economic Review, Lee Ohanian, a professor at uh, UCLA, published an article in the Journal of Political Economy, which is one of the top one or two or three academic journals in economics, uh, concluding that the New Deal made the Great Depression worse and longer lasting. And he doesn't cite uh, Out of Work. He doesn't cite the book Out of Work by uh, uh, Galloway and Vetter at all. They're very disappointing like that. But the point I'm making here is the mainstream, the Amer editor of the American Economic Review has come around to the Austrian view and it really is remarkable. He basically says what Roosevelt did was to try to cartelize all of industry and all of agriculture to monopolize, using government to monopolize. And he himself, Leo Hanian, if he ever taught microeconomics, he had to have taught that monopolies restrict production. Now, that's the mainstream view. And if you restrict production, you restrict, you restrict employment. And so you know, how can it be that they, they, they would not have done this? And so, so it had to be, and he apparently never realized that until he came up with this, uh, this new model, new mathematical model that he used to, to prove that. Okay, now there's another area where we made progress is just look at the wonderful bookstore out there and all these books with a, a lit, what I call literary economics uh, explaining the Austrian tradition. And I compare that to a, a story that I told Tom Woods on his radio show not too long ago when I was in graduate school there was a professor from the Ivy League that came to give a seminar. His name was Professor Un, spelled N-G, and he did a, he had a mathematical model, one of these mathematical models where it took three blackboards of mathematics to, to go through the model. And, uh, and at one point, one of my professors, Gordon Tullock, uh, uh, chimed in and said, but Professor Un, this is not anything at all like the real hamburger market. And Professor Un said, I don't care about the real hamburger market. I care about my model. And, and, and that's, how, that's how the mainstream thinks. There's, there's an article that I brought along with me by uh, Axel Leyenhoven, who Joe Salerno knows about. He's a well-known macroeconomist from UCLA. It's called Life Among the Econ. And he writes about uh, the, the sort of culture of, of, of the economics profession. And, he, and one of the things he says is this, says, quote, that what, a part of what, there's a different tribes, tribes in economics, and one's called the math econ, that's the tribe. He said, the math econ make exquisite models finely carved from the bones of a walrus. Specimens made by their best masters are judged unequaled in both workmanship and raw material by a unanimous iconographic opinion. If some of these are useful, and even econ testimony is divided on this point, it is clear that this is purely coincidental in the motivation for their manufacture. <laughs> then he goes on to say, whether the math econ know it or not, they point out, they do obey the ancient Pythagorean principle that philosophy must be pursued in such a way that its inner secrets are reserved for only learned men trained in math. And that's, that's how the, uh, the mainstream economics profession is. And that's why it has become, uh, in the 40 years, uh, 41 years that I was a professor, uh, it became more and more useless. Uh, and, so, and so, of course, and, and it's no, nobody more than the Austrians provides an alternative way of understanding how the economic world works. Another, another point I'd like to make here is that uh, uh, I call it the Card-Kruger fraud. Uh, uh, David Card won, was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics for a certain methodology. He compared New Jersey and Pennsylvania, one state raised the minimum wage, the other state didn't, and he claimed it had no effect on unemployment, minimum wage. 
And he won the Nobel Prize for the methodology, the methodology of comparing two different states and the reaction. And when I read about that, I thought, well, this is odd. I, the professors of mine in graduate school were doing this kind of research 30 years earlier. What, what, what's new about this? And not only that, it, it, was it not new, but the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, got their data, got, redid the study, and they said, they concluded that it had crippling flaws. And so the, you know, the guy won a Nobel Prize for a, uh, a, a methodology that has crippling thaws, okay? And so, and, and to quote, one more quote by Doug Casey on the use of mathematics in, uh, in economics. He said, once the fact of the matter is that everybody should be an, everybody should be an economist, not just a designated priesthood that have received an arcane and largely irrelevant education focused on mathematics with little to do with how the world actually works. It's important to understand how people go about producing, consuming, and trading with one another. How about that? Who would ever have thought that that should be the purpose of economics? Well, the Austrians do. There was another revolution in addition to the Keynesian revolution in the 20th century, and I guess you could call it the perfect competition revolution, which I alluded to earlier. And this was overturned. This was overturned by a lot of efforts that are usually assigned to the Chicago School of Economics. And because the perfect competition model, one of the assumptions was that a competitive industry has many firms. And so there were, for decades, there were attacks, government attacks on mergers, corporate mergers, because after all, if two companies merge, you have fewer firms. And so uh, a lot of mergers were disallowed, prohibited, uh, even though the effects of them, uh, and more often than not, was nothing worse, nothing more severe than economies of scale that allowed them to reduce cost and reduce prices. It was a competitive thing. And the Chicago School, for about a 20-year period, beginning in the 60s, pretty much overturned that kind of thinking that, uh, that mergers uh, are necessarily monopolistic. And the way they did that, though, was they temporarily adopted the Austrian way of thinking about competition as a dynamic, rivalrous process. And, and they showed in study after study that the effect of most of these mergers was either they just didn't work out as planned, or if they did work out as planned, the effect was lower costs, lower prices, and a more, more competitive industry. You know, benefit to consumers, but it was, it was because they adopted the Austrian way of thinking that, uh, that they did this. And one of my own articles, it was in, uh, published in the journal Economic Inquiry in, way back in 1988, uh, a co-author, Jack High, and I were able to survey all the economists who wrote anything at all about antitrust and regulation at the time the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed in 1890. It was a small group back then, believe it or not. We could, we could survey the entire economics profession, everybody who had a job as an academic economist. And there was unanimous opposition to the whole, whole idea of an antitrust law as a matter of principle because they thought it was inherently incompatible with competition. Okay. And, and it was and it always has been. That all changed in, by, in the 1930s, though, when uh, the new theory, the perfect competition theory, was adopted by the profession, and more and more economists came to embrace antitrust regulation, the late George Stigler once said, the reason for this is that uh, economists came to realize that they could make considerably more than the minimum wage as antitrust consultants. But Jack High and I argue that no, the main reason is they, 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 got, they dropped the Austrian understanding of markets of competition and adopted this, this phony theory of competition. Uh, and this, this theory, by the way, led to what uh, Harold Demps has called the Nirvana fallacy in economics, which lasted for, from it began around the 1930s until it began to be debunked in the last 20 or 30 years by a lot of research inspired by studies, basically studies of entrepreneurship. I'll just give one example of uh, the famous article by Ronald Coase. He's not an, not an Austrian, but for years, uh, the lighthouses were, were given as an example of market failure because it was said that 
uh, the, uh, the light from a lighthouse is a public good. Once it's out there, it's impossible to charge uh, any ship that's, that's coming into a harbor for the benefits of the light. And so therefore, uh, the government must either subsidize lighthouses or run them itself. And this was in all the textbooks decades ago. Well, Ronald Coase did something that a lot of the, the Harvard, MIT economists never do. He got up out of his swivel chair in his faculty office and looked around outside. In other words, he went to the library and he, he studied lighthouses and became an expert in lighthouses. And he found that in Great Britain, uh, private entrepreneurs had funded lighthouses for generations because after all, uh, it was their cargo that was being uh, shipped across the sea and then they standed to lose everything because the insurance industry was still in its infancy at the time that this was happening. And so that didn't really cover them very adequately. So their insurance was they paid, they contributed, they voluntarily paid for lighthouses. Okay, so entrepreneurship. And, and of course, who was known more for studying entrepreneurship and, and conveying the importance of entrepreneurship than the Austrians? And so, and that's one thing that, that led to all these theories of market failure. And there's a big literature in economics of case after case like this, where the so-called failure was fixed even before economists discovered it and, and decided to call it a failure. It was fixed by entrepreneurs like the lighthouse builders in England and, and elsewhere. And so this was, uh, this was called the, uh, the Nirvana fallacy in economics, where you compare the real world with some sort of utopian ideal that could never be achievable, and then you declare that the real world fails, and of course is in need of perfect politicians and perfect bureaucrats to solve the problem. That's the sort of the method of analysis. The final thing I'm going to say, I have a little note here that says economic witch doctors versus the Austrians, Let's not forget that it was people like Mark Thornton, Ron Paul, and Peter Schiff who all warned that there was a bubble in the housing market in 08, and that, or before 08, 2003, Ron Paul was saying this in, in public, and in all the economic witch doctors on TV were laughing at them when, when they said these things. They were right and the witch doctors were wrong as far as that. And so after, and so after the crash of 08, of course, we all know that they were right and we had the pathetic scene of Nobel Prize winning economists from the University of Chicago writing articles in the Wall Street Journal apologizing to the American public for missing this, for, for being in the dark about the impending bursting of the real estate bubble. And how pathetic. And so in conclusion, uh, in today's universities, as far as I see it, uh, what's going on is um, the last best hope, to quote Abe Lincoln, uh, uh, lies, lies, in, uh, lies in, in programs like Peter Klein's program at Baylor on entrepreneurship in a business school and in management. That's where economics, I think, has the best chance to seriously make headway because it's not so politically incorrect and crazy as the rest of the university system. And I believe Doug Casey hit the nail on the head when he said, everyone needs to be your own economist and Austrian economics is the best avenue to achieve that. And the best avenue would be to enroll in the new master's program in Austrian economics offered by the Mises Institute if you really want to get a really good education and use that for the rest of your life to understand how the economic world works. You don't have to get a PhD like I did, uh, although you can, you can give it a try. Maybe we'll have a PhD program someday in, in Austrian economics. Well, thank you very much. My time is up.